we're going to go over the last words of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but every single last word that he says in the gospel, it is very significant. I'm going to go over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but Mark and Matthew, they are pretty much the exact same thing. But, you know, Matthew goes a little bit above and beyond. He's like, look, this is this thing in Aramaic. But long story short, it's the same thing. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then eventually he cries out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. Now, people are like, oh, look, why is the last words of Jesus so different? It's not that different, okay? So in Matthew, Mark, he's just saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he cries, this is what he cries out in Luke. He says, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice. This is what he's yelling. <clears throat> He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. But of course, in the book of John, it's a little bit different. So after he does this, after he yells this out, right, um, he drinks a little bit of a uh, wine vinegar, so to say in uh, John chapter 19, verse 30. And here he says, it is finished. So these are the three things that we're gonna go over and talk about the great significance and great theological impact that each one of these have. In fact, these are super duper deep. So Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I come in my spirit and it is finished. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but there is a messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. It says in that day, he's talking about when Jesus comes, there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as the banner to the people for the Gentiles, by the way, Gentiles is anybody that is not ethnically Jewish, like I'm a Gentile, even though I'm Korean, I still count as a Gentile because I'm not a Jew, right? And it states that his resting place shall be glorious. Now, I like that, you know, I'm a big guy on rest. I like to chill. I like to vibe a little bit. But I, it's when it says the root of Jesse, He's talking about the lineage of none other than King David. King David's father is Jesse. And the first Psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is, which is Psalm chapter 22. Interestingly enough, each one of these prophecies uh, that Jesus says, the last final words happen to be messianic Psalm. So this is Psalm chapter 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is verse one. <clears throat> So let's go and read it together. I'm actually breaking down some of the more important passages. Like, um, I'm not gonna go over every single verse bit by bit. Don't get me wrong, I could do this, but it's gonna take so much longer. And I don't know if like a three hour video is worth it. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? So this is what Jesus is feeling. He says, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. And in fact, that happens to be the scene of the cross. Like the uh, Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're all pointing him out. They're like, oh, look, watch him save himself. Oh, look, he trusts God, doesn't he? Doesn't he say that, he's the, that, that God is his father? And they're like all mocking and they're all making fun of him. But this is a crazy part of the psalm he says look for dogs encompass me a company of evil doers encircle me and they have pierced my hands and feet and i don't know but that just sounds a little bit like jesus to me he says i can count all my bones meaning that yo you like this guy's just cut open they stare and they gloat over me they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. And that's actually what had happened with Jesus. The soldiers were casting lots for his clothes and they were trying to win it over. In fact, there is this thing called a chiasm. A chiasm is a Hebrew literary structure, like an X. And what it does is like this. It's like an undoing. It's like A, B, C, X, C, B, A. So all it does is like there's a buildup, there's like same literary patterns that are building up until it gets to a climax point. And then all of the things like ABC, it does it in reverse order. I actually listed it out. If, in fact, Psalm chapter 22 is listed out as like a cry for help. He's like, yo, I don't hear you. I mean, we've heard that before. I mean, we heard that in the beginning of the Psalm where it says, I cry out and I hear nothing. 
He's like, look, I'm crying out. This is for Israel. There's a personal I am statement that's going on. He's like, yo, what's going on? And all of a sudden, these bulls are going after him. These lions are going after him. And these dogs are going after him. And then something sharp piercing him. And eventually, there's a prayer that it seems to happen. There's a prayer for God's help. And look at this undoing. Remember how I said bull, lion, dogs? Now it's dogs, lion, and oxen, which is pretty much bulls. So it's like this reversing that's being done. And he's talking about himself. He's like, oh, look, now I feel like I'm getting better. He's talking about Israel. And this cry for help actually happens to be heard at the end of the psalm. So this is a good story. So Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So what do we know about this? Well, number one, Remember how he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After that, he just cries out with a loud voice. You don't really know what he says if you only read Matthew and Mark, but Luke seems to complete this picture. In fact, it says, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice. So he's calling out with a loud voice. This is his shout. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last that's what he did. He breathed his last. Now, this is also a messianic psalm. Not a lot of people know about this. Everyone focuses on Matthew and Mark, but that's only because Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, literally begins with that statement. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? That's literally verse 1. But this one, Psalm chapter 31, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is not in the first line or the first stanza. In fact, it is none other than the fifth fifth verse. So we're going to go and read some of this so that we have some better context. It says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. I like that. That's a pretty good vibe. That's a pretty good vibe if you ask me, right? It says, Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me. And that's that's crazy because the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, I don't know if you know this, but the Sanhedrin happens to be the religious council at the time. These guys are at the top of the top. The Sanhedrin got together. All the religious leaders got together, the heads, and they set a trap for Jesus. And then look, he says, for you are my refuge irregardless of that he still trusts him and then the bombshell is dropped into your hands i commit my spirit deliver me lord my faithful god now the rest of the psalm is very familiar with psalm chapter 22 he talks about his eyes growing weak with sorrow his soul and body with grief his body his life is consumed by anguish my years by groaning, my strength fails because of my afflictions and my bones grow weak. And because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and the object of dread to my closest friends. Now that's actually kind of what happened, is it not? Like right when the Roman soldiers came, all of a sudden his main homies are just gone. They're dipping out. They run away from him. And in fact, if you look at the next part, it says, those who see me on the street flee from me. And Peter happens to be fulfilling that prophecy. Ooh, that's rough, isn't it? That is rough. In fact, Peter's that guy that's like, Jesus, I will never forsake you. I will die with you. He didn't die with him. But I mean, he died later. But of course, uh, in this moment, he didn't. He totally betrayed him he did not acknowledge him he was definitely what you know i guess according to this thing would say the object of dread to my closest friends so jesus tells peter before the rooster crows um before the rooster crows today you will deny three times that you know me so that's exactly what happened and that's also the messianic psalm psalm chapter 31 but I like how this ends on a very positive note. I mean, both are ending on a very positive note. It says, but I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. By times, uh, my times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Now, if you had only partially read Father, Father, you know, that part, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The question comes into mind. The question is, did God the Father really forsake Jesus 
when he was on the cross. I mean, I've seen some explanations from Christians. I mean, don't get me wrong. They mean well. They mean well, but it's not the best light. They say, yes, God the Father, abandon Jesus because he had sin in your life. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't, I don't know if that's a good thing because number one, we have sin in our lives. Does that mean that God abandons us because we're in time? We're not like, we're not like in a good situation. This seems to answer that, alrighty? So this is like the same Psalm. He says, in my alarm. So this is like in his fear. This is in his worst state. I said, I am cut off from your sight. That's what he says. He's like, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He says, in my alarm, I have said that. Yet, look at this. Yet, you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. So this pretty much brings it all together. That means God the Father has never abandoned abandoned Jesus in his dread. He heard his cry. And what I like about this is this is a this is a psalm of encouragement. He says, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So that is the final verse of that. Mm. Now we're going to go into John. John happens to be very different. They don't even mention, Father, into your hands, commit my spirit. They don't do any of the loud cry thing. But he says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was fulfilled said you know to fulfill the prophecy i thirst so he drinks he drinks from a hyssop he drinks from a hyssop uh with sour wine in it and jesus had received the sour wine and says it is finished now i like this one a lot it's kind of gangster kind of reminds me of like action heroes he says it is finished he bowed his head and gave up his spirit just like um just like in luke he says father into your hands i commit my spirit so he just gives it up but now it comes to mind, right? The very next verse, the very next verse. We know that he gives up his spirit. We know he gives up his spirit in John chapter 19, verse 30. But in 31, it says, now it was a day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down, right? It says it was preparation day. Now look at this parentheses. Look at this parentheses. This parentheses is low key kind of deceiving in a way. He says that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who himself waiting for the kingdom of God, was bold, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Like there's something that's going on. Number one. There's a few statements by Jesus. In fact, there is two that I'm going to go over just in the book of Matthew alone. Look at this. For as Jonah, now this is Jesus. Jesus is like talking to some people. He doesn't really like what they're saying. He's like, I'm just going to give you the sign of Jonah. He says, as the sign of Jonah, he says, look, for as Jonah was three days and three nights. How many? Three. Three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish. So the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth again now he this is four chapters after this is matthew chapter 16 verse 21 from that time jesus began to explain to his disciples he's getting a little emotional here he's talking to his disciples and he's like look i'm gonna die this is this is this is gonna happen you know the religious leaders are gonna take me the elders the chief priests the teachers of the law right i'm gonna be killed and on the third day be raised to life now how is this possible? Because when it talks about pre preparation day, let me go back a little bit, right? Let me go back a little bit, right? It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Now people will say that this is none other than Friday, right? I mean, think about it. When it's Easter time, we say it's Black Friday, then it's Easter Sunday, and that's kind of how it goes. But the issue is that doesn't fulfill the three days and three nights. Here, I'm gonna go and open this up. Look at this. It says three days and three nights. They say this is day. This is how most people see this encounter. It says for Friday, which is day one, then there is day two, and this is night two or day three, or whatever. But it, it doesn't really fulfill the three days and three nights. And yeah, it is encompassing over slightly three. But the problem is, it only goes over two nights and one day, unless you count Sunday the day that Jesus rose again as the next day, but that's still two days and two nights. It's missing a whole day. 
So how do we go over this? You know, how do we go over this? Well, number one, we have to understand biblical language, and I'm going to go and break this down for you. So this is Leviticus chapter 23, verse three. Remember, the, Jesus was a Jew, so therefore we are going with the Jewish background. The biblical knowledge that he that he has is from a Judaic standpoint. So check this out. Ready? Six days you shall. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh is a Sabbath, a solemn rest, a holy convocation. You hear that? A holy convocation, a Sabbath, solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. Now, <clears throat> sorry. A Sabbath is usually the seventh day Sabbath. That's usually what it is. But they also use the word Sabbath for holidays. Now, question. What is a holiday? What is a holiday? A holiday is actually derived from the word holy day. Holy day. Because on holy days, you would take a rest. Now, in fact, there was a Sabbath. I'm going to say this again. There was a Sabbath every Friday evening to Saturday morning. That was a Sabbath. It was a holy convocation. But the thing is, this holy convocation happens to be none other than the Passover. Now, the time that Jesus died... It is during this festival. It is known as the Passover, or it is known also as the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Now, let's go, and uh, I'm still going through Leviticus chapter 23 so that we understand some of the holidays. It says, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations. You hear that? These are the holidays. These are the Sabbaths, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. It says, in the first month, now bear with me, we're going over holidays in Leviticus. I know you guys don't read Leviticus. You guys definitely should. It's really big. On the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Supper. This is the Lord's Supper, right? Now, remember, holy convocations, what are they called? Sabbaths. Now, on this one, right? These Sabbaths are not the seventh day Sabbath, but is a Sabbath. Remember how I said it's a holiday? It's a holy day. So when is the 14th day of the month? The thing is, it depends. Now, in a perfect world, every month will start on the same day. But if you look at the calendars, see this? The first day of the month, it's it varies. It always changes. You see this? You see this one starting on Wednesday. You see March starting on, on uh, Wednesday. Actually, that, that did that did line up. But you see April over here, it starts on Saturday. You see June starting on Thursday, July starting on Saturday. So every single month is kind of different. It very much varies, right? So on the first, on the 15th day, so after 14 days, on the 15th, the right after of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Breads to the Lord. For seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. So this is the Passover. This is a Sabbath. But it says, on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do not, you shall not do any ordinary work as you do on the Sabbath, right? Now, remember, on, on months, when it says on the 14th or the 15th day of the month, it, it's very random. It's usually very random because we don't really know when the month is going to begin. But the difference is, every single week, all the weeks are counted. So example, when I say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they still counted those. They said this is the first day of the week, the second day of the week, the third day of the week, the fourth day of the week. So they know exactly what it means. When I say the first day of the week, they mean Sunday. When I say the, se the seventh day, they mean Saturday. But when it says the 14th day of the month, it could fall on Sunday, it could fall on Thursday, it could fall on any one of these days, right? It is very random. So. The days of the month are random. The days of the week are specific. So when it says that you shall not do any ordinary work, it means that this is considered a Sabbath, a holiday Sabbath. Now check this out. It says, you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days on the seventh day. Now look at this, right? It's a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work. Now we already established that in Leviticus chapter three, that the seventh day is a holy convocation and you shall not do any ordinary work. Now we're gonna go back to the story. We're gonna go back to the story so that we could go and paint this picture together. You ready? So it says, after the Sabbath, at 
dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So we know that this is after the actual seventh day Sabbath. After the seventh day Sabbath, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, they went to the tomb. This is further reiterated in the Gospel of Luke. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. But in the book of John, it's a little bit more specific. I really like the book of John, especially with the crucifix story, because it kind of, uh, it kind of fills in the blanks that is not necessarily stated in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they are speaking to an audience that already knows. They already know. But for some reason, John decided to go and add a little bit further into this. He says, now is the day of preparation. Huh, day of preparation. Now, the day of preparation is usually understood to be on Friday during the day. And the next day was supposed to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, huh? They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Now check this out. It says that it was a special Sabbath. This is very different. Notice they don't say the Sabbath in the first red lettering. It was supposed to be a special Sabbath. Now they say a special Sabbath in other versions. This is a high Sabbath. But the second time they mention the Sabbath, they mention the Sabbath, meaning that there's a possibility just within this verse alone that these are two separate Sabbaths. Now, what seems to be uh, explained here is that the people, that the leaders that are being rushed because there's a special Sabbath and the Sabbath. Now, some conclude that they might be the same exact day because the proximity but in fact, it actually really was a proximity issues. If you just read a few verses before, here, this is John chapter 19, verse 31, you see that? But I'm gonna go to John chapter 19. Remember, this is 17 verses before. This is John chapter 19, verse 14. In fact, it says it was the day of preparation of the what? the Passover. Now, a lot of people overlook this, meaning that the day that Jesus was supposed to die was the day of preparation, not for the seventh day Sabbath, but for the Sabbath, the holy convocation for the Passover. So we understand here that after all of this, um, Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, they gather all this stuff. They do the Jewish bur uh, burial customs and they bury him really quickly because there's two Sabbaths that are being crossed here. The Passover Sabbath, right? The Passover Sabbath and also the seventh day Sabbath. See that? Now we know for sure that this Passover is the sabbath and then the jewish day of preparation which is the seventh day sabbath so we see that there are two sabbaths that are being crossed now just like matthew mark and luke same thing he says the first day of the week while it was still dark now the first day of the week um, I don't know if you know this, but the biblical days are very different from our days. We wake up in the morning feeling like P. Diddy, just kidding. We wake up in the morning, we go to sleep at night. But the biblical days happen to be morning, happen, happen to be evening first while it's dark. And then it happens to be the day. So mm, we know that Jesus is gone from the tomb on the first day of the week. Remember, it's still dark. Biblical days are evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning. So it makes sense that this is the first day. It could have even been Saturday night, low key, but uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like further uh, speculate on that one. So this is the common perspective for us. We think of Friday, then Friday night, then Saturday, then Saturday night, then Sunday. So this is how we see the days. But remember, biblical days are evening and morning, evening and morning. In fact, in creation, it began with darkness and then there was light. So in all creation, it says the first day was evening and then it was morning, evening and it was morning. But this is the Jewish perspective. 
this is a Jewish perspective. So this is uh this is um technically speaking, this would be Wednesday evening. So on Wednesday evening to Thursday morning would be the first day. You see this? Wednesday evening to Thursday morning would be the first day. Then Thursday night and Friday during the day would be the second day. And then Friday night and Saturday would be the third day. And then Saturday night, right, is when the Sabbath is over and it's dark. And technically, it would be considered the beginning of the first day. But check this out. Remember when we were talking about the Passover? There is a Passover Sabbath. There is a regular Sabbath. But the thing is, after the Passover, there happens to be a special Sabbath again after the main one. Look, Leviticus chapter 23, this is the same holiday for the Passover. He says, on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. Remember that language, that biblical language? That means a Sabbath. You shall not do any ordinary work. Again, that's a Sabbath. On the first day of the week, Jesus rose again, and they call it a Sabbath again. Meaning, when Jesus died, he went over three Sabbaths crazy right in the three days and three nights three i mean three nights three evenings and three mornings three evenings and three mornings this is crazy meaning that the sabbath which is a day of rest and jesus was resting in the tomb in the heart of the earth over three sabbaths the passover sabbath the seventh day sabbath and the first day sabbath meaning this was a triple what this was this was just a triple whammy of a sabbath now what i like about this is the prophet ezekiel right this is god speaking to the prophet ezekiel he writes this down god says i gave them that's us by the way i gave them my sabbaths as a sign between us so they know that i the lord made them holy keep my sabbaths holy that they may be uh, what remember i'm skipping down from verse 12 to verse 20 he says it again it's a keep my sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us then you will know that i am the lord your god now an interesting aspect of this chapter is when it relates to the sabbath god says to keep his sabbaths holy this is kind of a command this is a command so we're going to go and check out the commandments because the commandments actually have secrets in them about the cross You're, you don't believe me well here i'm gonna show you right i don't know if you knew this but there are two ten commandments there are two ten commandments one is in exodus chapter 20 and the other one is in deuteronomy chapter 5 they're pretty much identical they're all pretty much identical except for one thing and that happens to be the fourth commandment which is about the sabbath so this is exodus chapter 20 I like how he says, remember, out of all commands, he says, remember. He says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Do you remember that same language? This is the same thing that Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 and 20 was saying, to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons nor daughters nor your male or female servants nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in your towns but this is the part that's important so he gives us but now he gives a reason for in six days the lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them but he rested on the seventh day therefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and made it holy now this is kind of interesting but technically speaking there are two days that God didn't really do work in the creation account. For starters, we know it's the seventh day. But on the other side, it is also the first day. What? You're like, what? No, God said. No, no, no. Well, here, here, check this out. On the first day, God said, let there be light. The thing that happened was that light showed up. What is that light? People are like, oh, it's the sun. It is not the sun. It is none other than the Son of God. It is Jesus because the sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day. And to further elaborate this, uh, I actually have this whole aspect that is in another one of my videos called "In the, uh, the Most In-Depth Study of Creation. But to make a long story short, uh, Jesus says that I am the light of the world 
in John chapter 8, verse 12, he's like, I'm the one that began creation. I'm the light of the world. And in the last chap- in the last book of the Bible, in the last chapter, he says, I'm the bright and morning star. And in fact, without Jesus, the light, there would be actually no morning. Remember, creation says there was evening and morning the first day. Well, the first day was began because Jesus showed up. And this is why the days in creation are evening and morning, evening and morning. Like I said, one more time, because it started with the darkness. Now, here we are in Deuteronomy chapter five. It's a little bit different. It's pretty much the same. The first part's different. It says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And you know, it says six days you shall labor. It's pretty much identical. All of the same thing. The beginning part's the same, except the remember, but it does say observe, which just means keep. Now the reasoning for keeping the Sabbath is completely different. The reasoning is different. In fact, Deuteronomy says, to remember a different part he says instead of remembering creation he says remember that you were slaves in egypt and that the lord your god brought you out with a look at this i want you to highlight this point remember it mighty hand and an outstretched arm therefore the lord your god has commanded you to observe the sabbath the remember part is that the lord your god is delivering you from bondage from slavery with a mighty and outstretched arm mighty and outstretched arm and in fact that is crazy because this is exactly what jesus was doing on the cross but this time with two mighty and outstretched arms you see that two mighty and outstretched arms. He stretched out his mighty arms for us on the cross so that we may be delivered from the yoke, the bondage of slavery, the things that tied us down, our addiction, our past lives, the sins that we are slaves to. And in fact, this is why the New Testament always talks about the freedom of Christ setting us free from what? From the yoke of slavery right from the yoke of slavery so this is what jesus is saving us from now i went back to ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 and 20 because i want to show you some surrounding passages around the statement remember how deuteronomy said a mighty and outstretched arm well check this out ezekiel chapter 20 verse 33 the same chapter says as i live declares the lord god yahweh god right Surely with a mighty and outstretched arm, right? And with, this is, this is important, focus on this, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. Wrath poured out, wrath poured out. Remember it says mighty and outstretched arm. We know that Jesus died on the cross with a mighty and outstretched arm for both sides. But where is this wrath being poured out? We know that on the cross, Jesus had taken all of our sins he had taken the punishment he had taken the wrath but there is more to this story in the garden of gethsemane we see that jesus is taking the wrath here it says father if you are willing this is luke chapter 22 verse 42 father if you are willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done in this cup in this cup right over here is the wrath of God. You're like, what? You know, most of the time when people read the statement, remove this cup from me, most people gloss over this passage without a second thought. But in fact, this cup is none other than the wrath of God. Now, please do not mix up the cup of the covenant of Christ, right? There's a cup that Jesus does, which is a covenant, but this cup happens to be the wrath of God. Remember, they're completely different things, but in this passage, it is most definitely about the wrath because he doesn't really want to take it. Jeremiah 25, verse 15, this further uh, supports this claim. Thus, the Lord, the God of Israel said, take from my hand, <laughs> right? Take from my hand. I, I like how he says that. Father, if it is your will, right? Remove this cup from me. He says, take this cup from my hand. He's like, look, take from my hand this cup of wrath. But, th- but the thing is, there was no sacrifice that would atone for sin at the time. He says, make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. This is the cup of wrath. Now, the Sabbath command, both of them, both the Sabbath commandments is giving a foreshadow of Christ, 
not only the Ten Commandments, right? Not only are the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> but the uh, there's a crazy secret pattern that is in the Ten Commandments. There's a crazy secret pattern. Example, the first three commands are solely for God. These are God's commands, right? You shall have no other God, no other idols. You, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. These are solely for God. And I don't know if you knew this, but the number of God is three. Do you know what the number of man is by any chance? Six. The last six of the commands are for man. Now, I'm going to go and show you where it says that man's number is six. It is probably not the best reference, but it happens to be the main one. Um, he says, this calls for wisdom. Let one who understands and calculate the number of the beast. Oh, oh, right. This is revelations for it is the number of man. Six is the number of man. His number is six, six, six. Well, why is it number six? Well, for starters, man was created on the sixth day. So remember, the first three commands are for God. The last six are for man. And the commandment that smack right in the middle is none other than the Sabbath. Boom. This is where God and man meet. This is why it's called a holy convocation. In some of the translations, says a sacred assembly because this is where the divine meets the human. This is why the Jews worship together on the Sabbath day because this is where they go to church. They go to church because they're like, we sinful humans are there to meet the divine. And in fact, this is kind of what Jesus is, isn't it? Right? Both divine and man. Like, think about it. Jesus is known as fully man and fully God. And this is why it says, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. This is both in Matthew chapter 12 and Mark chapter 2. And in fact, we know that he is both divine and both human. He had rested threefold. We know that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, I like that our God is really good at taking a break. You know, I'm, I, I'm okay with that. I love taking breaks. And this is why Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.